Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Hogarth's Global Astrology. Know your planets, know yourself, or know your nation, know yourself. The two are interchangeable. Okay, so uh, what is this video about? Let's just dive in. So, again, excuse the uh, the whole uh, kind of Bono glasses, but it's getting quite late in the – well, it's not super late in the evening now. But, as you know, I have to wear these to protect my eyes from the blue light, uh, when I'm recording videos at night, which of course happens a lot, and it also keeps me up at night as well. The getting the blue light in your eyes after the sun has gone down uh, from screens and computers and stuff is isn't so good. So obviously, this is why I got the glasses on. Right, this is my William video, Prince William, the Prince of Wales. Time to look at his chart now. I we, we would have briefly briefly looked at his chart but as many of you know um i did um sort of like a deep vedic uh vedic perspective dive on princess catherine's chart uh, also known of course as kate in the in the uk and it it was it, that video is connected with a lot of people let's put it that way it's connected with a lot of people and I'll just reiterate again, I really do feel a lot of compassion for, uh, for for Kate because she's she's going through a lot. And we could see that in her chart with those kind of literal um, sort of like almost two holes in her stomach placement as, uh, as we saw astrologically in that Gandanta Neptune, which we will be speaking about again uh, today. And uh, I've been told that that has been echoed by some other readers. I don't know if it was before or after they watched my video, but anyway, nonetheless, it doesn't matter. The point is it's out there, it's on the record. <clears throat> and as we know, there's been tremendous um, speculation <clears throat> As to Catherine's health, uh, uh, from what we understand, um, she still has not been seen since Christmas, yeah, which is a long time for her. We've been told that she's been recovering from abdominal surgery. And she's expected uh, to uh, restart her royal duties in Easter. However, this video is about William, of course, her husband. And we have to have a look. And it's... Uh, is it, it's been very interesting. There has also as well been a tremendous amount of, of speculation around William, uh, around his uh, public appearances, uh, around his potential maybe difficult or conflicted relationship with alcohol and potentially other substances and stuff like that. But I would say alcohol is probably the main speculation at the moment. And of course, sadly, there was the uh, the tragic death of um, uh, Thomas Kingston, I think it is, the late husband uh, of the daughter uh, of the uh, Princess Michael of Kent, Prince and Princess Michael of um, of of Kent, who are uh, cousins to the Queen, if I remember correctly. Uh, sadly, he was found uh, deceased uh, at his parents' home uh, with allegedly uh, due to a, a gunshot wound to the head. Um, it is being classified as a suicide from what I understand. And this, of course, is an immensely, um, immensely difficult time, as you can imagine, uh, for the royal family right now with it seems a all sorts of stuff is going on and and i'll show you know in uh william's chart but as i've been saying ad nauseum but for those that don't know already according to sidereal astrology which takes in which takes procession of the equinoxes into account this is real science it's real uh, physics the stars are slowly moving backwards by one degree approximately every 71, 72 years. They do not wait, of course, until the 71st year to move backwards. They are slowly moving backwards from our relative point here on Earth, looking up at them due to the slight wobble that we have as uh, in the Earth's spinning of its axis. There's also a wobble within that, which is said to last approximately about 24,000 years. You know, some say around about 26, some people say less than 24, but it's 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 in that kind of cycle. And it deals with the signs that are rising on the horizon. Uh, so, you know, age of Aquarius, etc., and all of that kind of stuff. 
Western astrology, of course, doesn't take that movement into account. So because the stars are moving backwards, but they're still in the old placements, they're 24 degrees ahead of the actual physical placements of the stars. Hence why they say we are in the age of Aquarius now. I would say the age of Aquarius is dawning, but we are not quite there yet. We're still having to deal with lots of the uh, different energies uh, still present in the era of Pisces. Because each constellation, as it were, each sign lasts for about 2,000 years. So you can imagine the birth of Christ was over 2,000 years ago now. So we're now coming to the end of the age of Pisces. And because it goes backwards, the next sign or the sign before Pisces is Aquarius. So we are moving into that age now but we're very much in that overlap phase the age of pisces is setting the age of aquarius is dawning but we are not quite physically there yet but we are very very close okay so let's look at william's chart and just like with kate <coughs> my aim is just to illuminate just to read the chart and uh and we'll just look at the energies that are present as you've heard me say before, planets are people. They really are, and they represent concrete people, manifestations in our life. Uh, they represent blessings, challenges, uh, talents, gifts, or things that we may have to overcome at certain times in our life. And depending which sign they're in, which house they're in, and who they're with, also gives a tremendous amount of meaning uh, to a person's chart and its interpretation. Before I begin, after this, I'm going to do uh, Diana's chart. Now, I've not actually, I did, I looked at her chart for some research for a book I wrote years ago, which was, a, which was about the UK. I mean, it's on file at the moment. I'll have to see if it's ever published. Um, but I've not done a chart publicly for Diana ever uh, on my channel before. So after William, I will look at Diana's chart. We're going to look at everything. We're really going to go there because you can read the different people from each other's chart. When I look at William's chart uh, this evening, uh, we're going to see how Kate shows up in his chart, his wife. But also we're going to see Harry. Yeah, let's not forget that. And when we look at the uh, symbolism and all that stuff, and we'll also be able to see Diana as well. And then you'll see how everything kind of weaves itself together. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. Let's do present, share screen, and we'll get we'll get stuck in. Let's see here. Hmm. Anyway, it's taking a little while to get itself going. Let's do entire screen. Click on that, share. And then I'm going to get up William's chart. Here's William's chart. Let's kind of make that a bit smaller. There we go. Let's move this over here. Let's pull this down a bit. Let's go like this. There we go. All right. Right. Let's begin. So if we look here now, one thing that is good uh, when it comes to birth times of the royals, because they're officially announced when they're born, the birth times are extremely accurate. So what we see here, we see William, Prince of Wales, was born on the 21st of June 1982. I'm trying to remember uh, Catherine's uh, birthday, but she was like born like uh, about six months before him. She was born in 1981 um i think it was like january uh I can't, I can't remember but anyway she was she was born late 1981 he's born middle of 1982 and i think that actually makes him year of the dog yeah he was born in year of the dog anyway so we see here he was born at 903 in the morning uh in london um, it wasn't at Buckingham Palace, of course. It was one of, I think it was one of the hospitals in London, but he was born in London. So he's a Londoner, like me, like most of the royal family, uh, if they were born, uh, of course, in Buckingham Palace or London. Anyway, so if we look here, according to Vedic astrology, William is not a Capricorn rising. Oh, no, he is a Sagittarius. And this is very important because Sagittarius, along with the signs of Cancer, 
and Leo are also known as royal ascendants. Why? Because Cancer belongs to Moon, and the Moon is what? The queen of the chart associated with the metal silver. And then, of course, the sun is the king of the chart associated with gold, which is, you know, also as well, Leo. And then Sagittarius is is, is the masculine expression of Jupiter, which is the priest. And when you look, uh, you know, in life and all that kind of stuff, particularly when it comes to war and conflict, who is it that uh, often sends the troop to wars? It's either kings, queens or religion. Yeah. Think about it when you just look at history and the, the person who does the war, of course, is Mars, which is also a friend to the sun, the moon and Jupiter. So they're all friends and they all make part. They make up the part of the royal cabinet, as it were. So anyway, so we see here William is has a royal ascendant, according to Vedic astrology, which, of course, is absolutely bang on. He is a prince and he is the next in line to be king after Charles. So we see here now, we also see as well that William was born on eclipse. And there are many, uh, you know, significant people that are born, born on eclipses. Uh, there is a Vedic astrologer called Sam Jeppy, who I've actually studied with actually some of his courses way back in the day. Very good. Excellent astrologer. And he's actually done a he's actually done a mini series on how eclipses create prominent people in the world. What many people may not know is, is that the eclipses, they're, they're, they're a very unusual energy, otherworldly. Rahu is the head of the dragon. I call him Gobble Gobble, as many of you will probably know by now. Wherever Rahu is, we want more of. But there is obsession there. There's conversation there, but there can be it can deal with addictions, obsessions, obsessions, compulsions of some kind. Uh, whatever planet it's conjunct, it tends to disturb, particularly the sun and the moon. Why? Because according to uh, Ved uh, Vedic astrology and the mythology, where it was Rahu or a creature called Swabanu stole the liquid of immortality by hiding between the sun and the moon. He disguised himself, was able to drink the liquid of immortality, and it was the sun and the moon that informed on him. Uh, Vishnu, that was described disguised as the, as the gorgeous goddess Mohini, while of this was while she was dishing this stuff out, she, um, the sun and the moon were like Vishnu, Vishnu. This isn't a deva, one of the planets. It is a demon. So he changed into his fierce form, which was Shiva, through his disc and cut off the head of Swabanu. But it was too late. The liquid of immortality reached the body. So Rahu and K2 became these immortal characters, but with a severed head and the body. So Rahu is that severed head. It is insatiable in many ways. Why? Because whatever it eats, it never reaches the body. It just falls out. So it's never full. K2, on the other hand, the south node of the moon is the body without a head. K2 has the ability to know things very, very deeply, but it's a very introverted energy. It's a very shy energy. It's a very quirky energy. It's a very awkward energy as well. But K2 is also known as a mute planet. Makes sense, doesn't it? If you don't have any head, you can't say anything. So what it is K2 is deeply intuitive and it feels more than it says. And that's very important to understand. K2 is also like a little whirlpool in the chart. Uh, it's like a vortex. It's like a black hole. And whatever K2 is with, there is always, almost always dissatisfaction with whatever that planet represents or even potentially even that house. Yeah, but particularly if it's conjunct any other planets, they will show there's there's an intensity, some dissatisfaction. That planet, whenever the nodes are with planets, the planets get disturbed. Now, this is particularly relevant in William's chart because straight away we need to then talk a little bit about Diana. We need to talk a little bit about Prince Charles. Why? Because he was born on an eclipse. So eclipses are caused when the nodes of the moon, as you can see here, Rahu North Node here in his seventh house, K2 South Node here in his first house. They're always exactly opposite. Always always retrograde as well. Sometimes they actually go direct, but most of the time they are retrograde. 
Now, eclipses happen when the nodes, so whenever basically a lunar eclipse, a lunar eclipse happens when uh, the moon is opposite the sun. It's a full moon where it's very bright. And then the Earth's shadow comes in between that and makes the moon kind of like a bloodish reddish kind of color. That's a lunar eclipse. The solar eclipse is on the new moon. So here, like you can see here with, with William, uh, here the sun and the moon, you see, were, were very close together. This is a new moon. The moon was dark. It had no light of its own. This is very significant. You can see here is Rahu. Yeah, so you can see he was born on an eclipse. The ancients also referred to eclipses as king makers. I kid you not. King makers. What is William going to be? He is going to be the next king, of course, maybe sooner rather than later, because, of course, there's issues with his father, Charles. But you will also see here the moon is here now. Now, as you heard me say before, planets are people. Planets are people. So what does the sun and what does the moon represent? The moon represents our emotions, how we feel about things, our childhood, how we instinctively respond to situations, people, how we get our needs met. And the moon also represents the mother. What is the sun? The sun uh, represents at, at the kingdom that we're building this lifetime, how we're showing up in life, our part of the divine spark, our sense of confidence, our sense of self, our vision for ourselves. But the sun also represents the physical body of the father. Now, this is extra critical when it comes to William and when it comes to people who have Ketu in the first house in general. Because what it means is it means Rahu is also always in the seventh house. Now, remember, the seventh house, I don't know if I said it already, is anyone that's not us. So it doesn't just represent the marital spouse. It represents business. It represents our reputation. The seventh house is also the public. It also has to a, lot, a lot to do with name and fame and recognition. Because, of course, it's the it's the outside world, it's trade, imports, exports, services of all kinds, contracts, marriage, but not just marriage, business contracts, business partners, <clears throat> reputation. Very public house. It can also deal with open enemies. It can also be the courthouse as well in uh, mundane astro astrology. So if we look here, there's a complex energy going on because here we have the moon, which is the mother. And the sun, which is the father, together with Rahu. Do you remember how I said the nodes are irritating? They disturb whatever planets they're with. There's also something as well that Rahu likes a lot. And one of the things that Rahu loves is attention and fame, wealth and riches. He also likes to be in certain signs as well. Rahu does very well in the air signs and the earth signs because they belong to either Mercury, Venus or Saturn. And those are the signs in which Rahu does well. Rahu has an earthy quality. So he's considered uh, by many to be exalted in the sign of Taurus, which is very earthly and sensual. And Ketu is considered to be exalted uh, in the sign of Scorpio. Yeah, the vortex going deep into things. There are debates about where the nodes of the moon are truly exalted. But, you know, they do do well in um, very well in those signs in general. And, of course, they're also going to do well in air and in fire. Rahu is said to have the nature of Saturn. He also he also he deals with fears, but it can deal with irrational fears. Saturn deals with real fears that are tangible and have manifested. Rahu Aketu is said to be the hottest planet, even hotter than the sun. Ketu can actually have an energy, particularly when it's in a fire sign of silent but violent. Just so you know, really can. K2 can have an intense temper, but it's simmering, boiling, seething underneath the surface. P 
particularly when it's in fire signs or particularly when it's with Mars. So bear that in mind when we come back to William's first house. So if we look here, Rahu, K2, but Rahu, an agitator. And remember the nodes of the moon are considered enemies to the sun and the moon. We see here there is a huge combination of enmity here. But at the same time, there is elements there of success because the moon actually uh, does well in the signs of Gemini. Yeah. Mercury is considered the love child of the moon, but Mercury doesn't love the moon so much. But either way, the moon does very well in the signs of Gemini and in Virgo. So it shows here that William, William is intelligent. He does have an intelligence to him. Um, a certain speed, alacrity, uh, good uh, ability to learn, uh, probably very curious and actually has a hunger for lifelong learning and stuff like that. So he's probably always learning something or other. He's obviously got a great skill set. He's also a helicopter pilot and does all of these duties and stuff like that. And he, you know, executes them well. Yeah. When he's not wobbling, but we'll talk about that in a minute. However, what we need to look at here is look, the moon is in Ardra Nakshatra. Now, let me tell you, I know this Nakshatra very, very well because I've got my moon in Ardra. Now, it can be a wonderful, it can be a wonderful placement, pardon me. But Ardra is a very difficult Nakshatra, very difficult. It has immense challenges to it. And in fact, all of the uh, Rahu Ketu Nakshatras are challenging. They are, particularly the Rahu ones, which can be very bombastic and dynamic. So what are the nakshatras ruled by Rahu? Ardra is one. Swati is another. And another one which, sit, uh, which sits in Libra. And another one which you don't, there's no planet here, is called Shatabishak or Shatabisha, which sits in Sidereal Aquarius. What are the K2-ruled nakshatras? The K2-ruled nakshatras are uh, Ashwini, which is the first nakshatra, Marga, which is the first nakshatra of Leo, and Mula, which is in the early degrees of Sagittarius. And we see, aha, William has a planet here. Now, this is already telling me a lot and I'm wondering, oh God, <laughs> I'm wondering what I what I can share here, because something is really starting to leap out at me about William's chart. And it would be very controversial for me to say, I, um, I, let's just say I can allude to certain things, but I'm not sure if I can be explicit. Remember, there's. There's a lot of censorship on this platform, but I'm noticing something really quite significant here. And I'm like, mm. Man, I read a lot of charts, a lot. And I'm seeing stuff. Anyway, if we look here. What is Ardra Nakshatra? So each Nakshatra has its own deities, its own name, its own symbolism, etc. Ardra has two symbols or two main ones. It's known as the moist one. Or the wet one or it, it it's it's associated with storms and one of its symbols is the teardrop so ardra means tears it means storms the deity here is called rudra rudra is a deity that is a composite of all the fierce parts of certain gods that mush themselves together to shoot down one of the architects of the heavens who wanted to basically mate with his daughter to create you know, a perfect race of people here on planet Earth. And that happens in Rohini. I've just seen, oh, he's got, he's, this is so interesting. He's got uh, Mercury in Rohini. And the idea is, is that he was chasing her across the sky into Marigashira and then got shot down in Ardra by Rudra. Yeah, who's one of the ancient hunting gods. So this has got a lot to do as well with hunting, uh, shooting, um, it's, it deals with storms. He's known as the god of the howling winds. So basically, Ardra is a very tempestuous and tumultuous nakshatra, and so is Mula. This part of the sky, Sagittarius, sorry, Sagittarius and Gemini, is known as one of the most tumultuous parts of the sky. But really, it's Mula 
and Ardra in particular that are the most difficult. And of course, Ardra is ruled by Rahu, who's right here in his own nakshatra. And Mula is ruled by Ketu, who is nearby in Purvarashada. So what this shows is there's a, a tremendous intensity to William that may not be first apparent. Particularly when K2 is in the first house, it creates shyness. It makes a person extraordinarily sensitive and shy, particularly when they're younger. And if you know, William was known as the more shy one. Harry was the more kind of outgoing one, wasn't he? Maybe not quite as bright, but certainly, you know, happy-go-lucky and oh, being a lad and all of that kind of stuff. So there's this intensity there. There is a quiet intensity to William which is not necessarily obvious, but is probably known by those that know him well. And remember what I said about K2 being in fire signs. It can show an intense temper as well. I'm not throwing aspersions. I mean, I'm just showing the combination here. That, that, that's what this stuff can mean. Anyway, going back to the moon <clears throat> and the sun, planets that are together are, are swapping information talking, blending their energies, whether they like each other or not. Now, sun and moon are considered husband and wife. But when the moon is now, how does this work? Jupiter and Venus are considered the benefics. And benefics means sweet, generous in nature, but they can still cause their own problems. But, you know, they're known as the gurus and they're sweet. Then you have the malefics, yeah, the malefics, which are cruel planets. But just because a planet's cruel doesn't mean it's evil. So who are the, who are the cruel planet? The cruelest is considered Saturn. Then close second is Mars. Then you have the nodes of the moon, Rahu and Ketu. They're cruel as well, where they'll probably give the age to Ketu, yeah? When Ketu is doing some stuff, oh, my God, can be just dreadful. And then the sun is considered a malefic as well, but a mild malefic. The sun is considered noble. Now, if you look here, the sun, when in the sign of Gemini, is considered to be in a friendly sign. Yeah, the sun considers Mercury a friend. So here, because Mercury deals with communication of all kinds, it can show a cordial relationship with the father, because remember, the sun it represents the physical body of the father. So this is Charles, quite literally. And you'll see here it's in the nakshatra. You won't be able to see it. The sun here is in the nakshatra, which is called Marigashira. Here we are. Marigashira. Now, Marigashira means the search for beauty. So what it means is William has an interest in terms of the search for beauty. He is uh, moved by beauty, beautiful things. It also has a lot to do with collections and stuff like that. Also as well, the uh, star, the main star in this nakshatra, in this constellation, is called Bellatrix. And Bellatrix is also known as the female warrior. Now, this is really interesting because, of course, we also have the moon next door, but you'll see how this uh, dovetails in. So Marigashira is the search for beauty or the star of searching. And if this is also represent the body of the father, it can also mean the father has been on a constant search in his life. A constant search for love and beauty. Isn't that interesting? It also means as well the father, or there is an element to William that is, is constantly looking, constantly roving, because the symbolism of Marigashira Nakshatra is the deer or the antelope. But if you think of deer, deer are very curious, but they're also very flighty. If we look at this from the perspective of Charles, his father, let's not forget Charles was a bachelor for quite a long time before he married Diana, yeah, who would be here, the moon. Let's not also forget that Diana is the name, the, the, the Roman name for the goddess of the moon, who the, I think the Greeks called Artemis. So Diana, I mean, literally, literally here, like this is Diana. And Diana is next to who is now a king. Now, remember, the sun represents kings, queens, uh, can't, well, the moon is queen, but, you know, leaders, CEOs, all of this kind of stuff. In Queen Elizabeth uh, II's chart, the sun in her chart was exalted at its most powerful. So it means her father was a king, obviously. 
But it also means she was king-like as well in terms of her reign, the likes of which will never be seen again. Anyway, so it means the father was on a constant quest, a constant search. He had many girlfriends before he was basically effectively told to settle down and marry Diana. So you see, there was this constant search. He was linked to all sorts of people, celebrities, I think, you know, uh, uh, he was a big fan of Barbara Streisand, and I think he always had a sweet spot uh, for, for her. And uh, she actually said in her autobiography, she said, hmm, maybe if I played my cards right, I could have become the Queen of England. She wasn't far wrong. Because <laughs> we know Charles is also a big fan of the arts as well. Uh, but he had a lot of girlfriends and all of this kind of stuff before he was basically made to settle down uh, with Diana. But it means there was a constant roving, a constant searching and we also know as well how history has played out. There was someone else who was in his heart. Yeah. So that's talking about Prince Charles, which, of course, this stuff is well documented. But it shows that William has a certain quality to him as well, which is searching, which is maybe not satisfied. Yeah. But the sun is strong here because Mariga Shira Nakshatra actually belongs to Mars and Mars and the sun and Jupiter and the moon are all friends. Now, if we look here, <clears throat> the moon, the mother is in Ardra. Now, this has a very dramatic effect on the moon. Because the nodes are enemies to the moon anyway and the sun. But you can imagine what happens when the moon is in the nakshatra of one of her enemies, Rahu, has an intense effect on the moon. And Rahu is in the same, his own nakshatra. So this is really compounding, having a profound effect on the mother. Now, um, Ardra, what I found is when the moon is in Ardra uh, nakshatra, it can affect the mental state of the mother. It Because the, it's literally... It's very intense, and Rahu's also there. So we know, of course, this is well documented now. Diana did struggle with her mental health. I'll go into the depths of her chart, of course, when I'm reading her chart. But we can read her via William, because, of course, William and Harry are her sons. So the moon here is Diana. But it also shows as well that the mother is dynamic, unpredictable. Yeah? The moon is does pick up strength, of course, in the sign of Jan. Jan of of um gemini <clears throat> it also shows as well that the mother's language can have an immense impact now remember uh, diana had to do work on her speeches and all of that stuff do you remember she was very softly spoken and you know very doe-eyed remember was looking you know that way and she had to find her voice and when eventually she did find her voice my goodness what an impact it made it was almost like a tornado kind of ripping through wasn't it so we see here the fierceness of, of Diana. She was always a fierce protector of, of, of her sons. And she really, in many ways, embodied the spirit of the hunter goddess, Diana. And this Rahu boosted it up. It's in the seventh house, which also deals with fame. It can show what? That the parents are famous. Of course, this is Charles here, the son in the seventh house. But you'll notice here the moon is closest to Rahu. The moon here is almost exactly at 12 degrees. And here you see Rahu is at 19 degrees, 43 minutes. So it's almost at 20. But that's still close. Yeah, that's still very close. So it shows that Rahu has the dominant influence of the mother. Of course, Diana was what? One of the most famous women in the world. So this can mean what? To have an exceptionally famous mother. But not only that, let's not forget, the seventh house does also as well talk about the spouse, the marriage partner. So while we're looking at the moon here, this isn't only Diana. It also shows this will also be showing the qualities of Kate or Catherine. So that can mean what? To have an extremely famous wife, which of course she is, because she's going to, assuming all goes well, I mean, I think it's all a bit touch and go at the moment until we see her, which we which we haven't. Uh, but it shows what? The, the spouse could be immensely famous as well. But it could also show that the spouse has issues because Ardra Nakshatra is here.
So we see there is a quest for beauty as well with uh, with uh, Catherine. Uh, as I said before, she is a Cancer ascendant according to Vedic astrology. Cancerans are very sensitive, and her ascendant is Aslesha Nakshatra, which can the shadow of Aslesha can deal with mental disturbances or emotional disturbances and stuff like that. She's very very sensitive, but this is also talking about the partner. It can show the partner's very. Uh, famous, but that that fame, that adulation, that attention is also having a disturbing quality on the spouse, because that that Rahu is there. Rahu also represents addictions as well. Let's not forget that too. So we see here, there's a lot going on. The moon also represents the matriarchal line as well also represents, you know, uh, grandmothers, great grandmothers, stuff like that. So the series. And, and if we think of the queen mother, for example, everyone knows she was rather fond of a, of a gin and tonic. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Well known, very well known. So we can see here, this is what I refer to as four dimensional astrology. When I look at a chart, it's very much like looking at a sheet of music. Certain planets sing certain songs, make certain tunes in certain signs and houses. But the four dimensional part is when I look at a chart, it's like looking at a Rubik's cube. So we can see here the moon is serving several functions. It is Diana quite literally the birth mother, but it's also showing the, mater the the matriarchal line. So this is also Queen Elizabeth II, and this is also uh, Queen Elizabeth, the queen mother, his great grandmother. And here we can see there is that element of, of Rahu where there can be addictions. It, it shows as well, like, look, Rahu deals with food as well. Rahu literally deals with food. That's why I call him gobble gobble. If we think back with Diana, the bulimia, yeah, the bulimia, the eating disorders, because Ardra does have that quality. But let me tell you this, Ardra also is known as the gemstone. It's the bright shining gem, which I, uh, for me, is akin to a diamond also. So it can mean to be cut and faceted by life until we shine. Ardra is also very truthful in that chapter as well, in when in the positive. However, the shadow of Ardra can deal with lies and deceit as well. Duck Larange, let's not forget, Duck Larange. Trump has Mercury in Ardra nakshatra, so you can see how it can work the other way. So this is, this is a blend. Obviously, I'm not calling William a liar, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is that his internal world is quite tumultuous. What we... The surface of him doesn't represent what is going on inside. If we look here, uh, because they're very close in age, William also has a Gandanta Neptune. So for those who may be watching this video for the first time, what does Gandanta mean? It's sort of like a drowning point. It means a karmic knot. It's the sections of the zodiac where in the ancients in Vedic astrology said the different components were tied together. Gandanta points happen when water goes into a fire sign or fire into water. So here, one Gandanta point is in the sign of Cancer. Water sign going into Leo, fire sign. It is the last two degrees of water and the first two degrees of fire there. Then if we look here, Scorpio going into Sagittarius, Scorpio water sign going into Sagittarius fire. Last two degrees of Scorpio, first two degrees of uh, Sagittarius. And then the final one here is Pisces going into Aries. So the last two degrees, 28 degrees or so of uh, sidereal Pisces going into the first two degrees of sidereal Aries. Any planet there is considered to have more karmic challenges and to be drowning. It, it's intensified, it's grasping, it can't quite find its feet. Becomes very intense, which isn't always a bad thing, but most of the time it's a bit tricky. So if we go here, we've got Neptune Gandanta in William's first house with K2, which is also like a whirlpool. 
for Kate, because she's a Cancer ascendant, I just can't round. So imagine this is her first house here. The sixth house represents the stomach, the digestion. So if we count from Cancer, one, two, three, four, five, six. This Gandanta Neptune, like I said, is happening in her stomach. She has also got uh, the nodes of the moon there as well, because they were both born on eclipses, because the eclipses happen about six months apart. And that is the difference approximately from what I can remember in terms of their age. How interesting, which means their lives are more fated. For Kate, the, the K2 combination is, is happening in, in her stomach, but for, for William, it's happening in his body. What does Neptune represent? Neptune dissolves the boundaries between the three dimensional realms and the realms beyond. It can be very spiritual, deals with film, photography, all of these things, beauty of all kinds, opulent wealth it can deal with as well because it's the higher octave of Venus. However, what is the shadow of Neptune? Neptune deals with scandals, secrets, things that are mysterious. It also deals with gaslighting as well. Neptune also deals with making the unreal appear real. The positive manifestation of that is like, like I've seen with people with this planet strong, they, they work in special effects or they work in the movie industry. But also as well, um, Neptune is also the planet that gets us out of our body. It deals with liquids and gases of all kinds. It's an immensely powerful planet. He can even deal with psychedelia as well, psychedelic drugs and stuff like that. He's the marijuana that people smoke or, you know, you know, a bit of pot or, you know, whatnot. Heroin, you know, for some people, because he also deals with liquids and stuff. But he also deals with alcohol. Alcohol. And this Neptune is drowning. It's in the Gandanta point. Look. See, it's that one degree, 56 minutes. It's in that two degree portion of sky next to K2, which is like a black hole, something that needs to be filled. And Neptune is the god of the sea. And this is retrograde, which means it was closer to the earth, which in Vedic astrology means it's more powerful. But it also means there's more karma on it. It's in Mula Nakshatra. Mula Nakshatra, the deity of Mula Nakshatra, is called Niriti, the goddess of destruction. Yeah, the goddess of destruction. But what is being destroyed? Ideally, Niriti destroys illusions. But guess what? Mula Nakshatra in particular has a lot to do with addictions as well. And there's a very self-destructive uh, quality to Mula Nakshatra as well in particular. Be very self destructive because the person can get into world. I mean, here, quite literally, this is happening in William, his body. So it shows there is an incredible sensitivity there, but an immense dissatisfaction with himself on some level, which is probably deeply secret, which we, the public, don't know about. How would we? K2 is shy, it's introverted energy. Rahu is the extroverted energy. If we think of Diana, for example, how she was there on the world stage for all to see. People were what, obsessed with her. This also shows how people were addicted to Diana and her fame and her shine. You know, Rahu will do that, will make things extreme. He can have almost a Jupiterian quality as well, even though he's carries the nature of Saturn, can deal with fears and all that kind of stuff. He can also be Jupiterian as well. And in fact, Jupiter is the only planet that can control Rahu. So we see there's a lot going on here, a lot going on here. And, oh, this is going to be so controversial, but, you know, I have to say, it. this section of the sky is more curious, shall we say, very curious in all sorts of things. Gemini, Sagittarius, I kid you not, particularly Mula and Ardra. Curious in all sorts of things. So I don't think I want to take it any further than that, but you guys join the dots. Yeah, I read a lot of charts and I know I know what this stuff means. I know what this stuff means, particularly if I'm looking at a man's chart and I see this configuration. 
if we look here now if we look here we also need to look now what is venus venus in a man's chart uh literally uh, deals with the wife yeah literally deals with the wife let me just see how i'm doing on time just move this over okay i've got a little bit of time here so uh venus literally deals, deals with the wife but venus deals with women of all kinds from girlhood up to maturity so when we look here as well this isn't only kate or catherine it's also princess charlotte bless yeah but we're not reading we're not reading we're not we're not reading we're not reading on on the kids yeah? and that's not relevant first of all they are too young they are just too young but nonetheless it's interesting but here if we look at this this is the main interpretation here for william's chart venus will be the wife so this is catherine quite literally but it will also be indicative of all the women in his life if we look here you see mercury is here so both these signs are very strong very uh, both these planets are very strong because they're venus is in its own in in its own sign and she's with a, a best friend mercury and mercury does very well in Taurus and Libra. Basically, planets do well in the signs of their friends. Venus uh, is friends with Saturn and with, with Mercury. However, Venus does debilitate, though, in the sign of Virgo, which belongs to her best friend Mercury. She's delighted, but not as delighted as, debilita as the debilitation of Mars in Cancer. I know it's complicated, but, you know, bear with it. So here, what does this show? It shows tremendous eloquence. It means the wife is eloquent. Why? So because Mercury is here, the planet of speech, strong. Strong. However, there are some slight issues here, because if we look here, the Venus is in the nakshatra called Kritika, which means uh, Kritika, the symbol of Kritika is the blade. It deals with the razor blade. It's very sharp. It's very critical. Yeah. Critica, if you think about it. Part of the story here is, is the falsely accused. It's just come to me. Basically, the Criticae were the wives of the uh, uh, Septasi, so that, you know, these Rishis and whatever, and they were fal falsely accused of, ha of having an affair. Isn't that interesting? So here with with venus here now this nakshatra belongs to the sun and the sun and venus are not friends so this venus is very uncomfortable even though she's in her own sign of taurus she's in the nakshatra of the sun so isn't this interesting maybe kate has been falsely accused of something just saying or she could face accusation that is not necessarily true. Isn't that interesting? It's just, it's just dawned on me. I'm like, oh my God. However, when Venus is strong, Venus is, uh, I, my nickname for Venus, I call it Miss Congeniality. Venus is all about love. Yeah, the arts, beauty, all of these things, food, assets, nutrition. So here she is, she's very strong. Also deals with vehicles, boats, yachts, well, Neptune is more yachts, what I find. But anyway, she, here Venus is very powerful. Venus is also the planet of resuscitation and rejuvenation. Venus is also known as the nurse of the zodiac. But what a lot of people don't know about Venus is when Venus is strong, particularly when she's in her own signs of Taurus, Libra, or exalted in Pisces, and to a slightly lesser extent when she's in friendly signs, I wouldn't count Virgo, though, because... Uh, She's debilitated there. But Venus also gives the gift of prophecy. What this means is, is that there is an element here where William has a lot of kind of intuitive insight. But as I said in Kate's video, <clears throat> it can also show as well, because this Venus is here is very strong, it can also show as well that the wife has intuitive gifts. However, look here. Do you see that thing that looks like a bit like a key? That means Chiron. And Chiron is the wounded healer. And what I found is this, wherever Chiron is in the D1, it shows where we've received a wound in life. Could be mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, or financial, or all of those things. Or whatever, whatever planet Chiron is with, will show that there might be wounding in connection with that planet.
So here, Venus is what? The wife. Chiron is with the wife. It means the wife is wounded in some kind of way. Well, there's a significant female figure in his life that was wounded. That's also talking about Diana, obviously. It also shows he has difficulties, some challenges and stuff and woundings in, in relationships in general, because Venus literally deals with it is it, she is the planet of marriage, relationships, stuff like that. If we also count around to uh, Venus. Now, remember as well, Taurus also deals. Uh, Taurus is the natural second house of the Zodiac. And we also see the houses as the birthing process. So the first house, yes, it deals with the body, but also deals with the top of the head. The second house, uh, and it's relative to Aries. So even though this is Sagittarius rising, the first house also always has an element of Aries to it. Second house always has Taurus. Taurus deals with the face, the neck and the teeth, goes from the eyebrows down to here. So it has a lot to do with what we put in our mouths, nourishment. Now, if we count round to Williams, Where's Venus is? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, he's got planets in the stomach as well. But let's not forget, this is Taurus. So Taurus is also dealing with the mouth, what we eat and what we drink. So obviously with this Gandanta Neptune, and Neptune also can deal with alcohol and stuff, yes, does William have a problem more than likely? In fact, there's actually quite a lot of accounts. Some say that he may have been drinking since he was 13. Now, a lot of people don't have that much mercy and stuff like that when it comes to the royal family, but let's, let's not forget these are still people and this is addiction. This is the case. I saw William swaying the other day and uh, when he was doing his me medal presentation, I was, I was watching some uh, some other YouTubes, uh, YouTubers talk about it. And they were talking about their compassion, saying, oh, you know, Will was struggling, you know, you know, with his, his, you know, his difficulties and everything that's going on. But, you know, when I saw the video, I just thought he's drunk. That was my instant. He was like this. Sure, you could see. I mean, he. I mean, he did look kind of desolate and stuff like that. But let's not forget, Venus is sitting in the sixth house. Venus is the wife, but the sixth house is the stomach. If we look here, Chiron wound to the wife, wound in her stomach. It repeats again in William's chart. It also shows that she's struggling. She's struggling to, to what? Overcome something to do with health and healing. Chiron, remember Chiron was the wounded healer, but let's not forget the context. Let me give the context for the, the Greek mythology here. Chiron was a centaur, half man, half beast. He was taught by the god Apollo in all things, astrology, mythologies, uh, methodologies for healing, etc. He became so good, so exceptional at his healing that he became famous, even with the gods. He could heal almost anyone or anything. Nothing was beyond his powers. And such was his, his fame and his success. The gods made him immortal. Yeah, which means he couldn't die. Anyway, uh, Hercules, or Heracles, as the, the ancient Greeks called him, of course, was going through his different trials and this, that, and the other. Anyway, he's going through his different trials, and apparently he accidentally shot Chiron in his heel, in his hoof, with this uh, arrow that was dipped in the poison of the Hydra, or some such beast, this horrific poison. And he accidentally shot Chiron there. So Chiron was in agony as this poison ravished his body, but he couldn't die because he was made immortal. And for all of his skills, for all of his knowledge, for all of his herbal law and medicines that he learned, he couldn't quite heal himself. Wherever Chiron is in the chart, as I've said, and it's if it's with planets, it will indicate 
some kind of wound associated with those with those with whatever those planets are associated with so here we see venus the wife in kritika nakshatra which is sharp it also shows the it also is known as the razor blade or the dagger it can speak about surgery and it's in the sixth house the stomach my goodness the wife has to have some kind of stomach or something some kind of surgery with her abdominal area now there's huge you know um speculations about what those things could be some say it was an ectopic pregnancy uh some say she had to have a hysterectomy some say she had her ovaries removed some say it was a bowel obstruction and she's had this and a colostomy bag and there's all sorts of speculations going on but what it, what we can see is how the astrology or at least the vedic astrology will mirror this because there it is one two three four five six venus the wife in the sixth house in the area of the stomach wounded it also shows as well there could be some um, challenges with communication potentially between them as well and although this venus is strong it is in the sixth house and the sixth house carries the energy of the sixth sign virgo where venus debilitates so in a funny way although this venus is strong and of course think about it, kate is beautiful uh you know she's eloquent she's elegant she has so many of those what we would consider those princess-like virtues because venus is also the princess by the way but we see here with this chiron here there's more going on underneath the surface there's some kind of challenges there let's look uh, let me just see how i'm doing on time let's look a look let's take a little look see at harry huh let's look at harry all right so if we, if we look here now planets are people as you've heard me say ad nauseum so what does mars represent mars represents in mars is a male planet so sun mars and jupiter are considered male planets mars represents land real estate war conflict battles fighting what uh you know sharp objects gunshot wounds all, all of this kind of stuff we all know the horror with it however mars also represents logic problem solving um logical thinking um crisis management fixing things inventiveness as well there's that but mars represents siblings and brothers in particular so of course when we look here this Mars has to be Harry. Who else can it be? Of course, it's Harry. This will also represent uh, um, um, William's male sons as well. But again, we're not reading on them. This is Harry. Now, remember I said planets, when they're sharing space with other planets, they blend their energies whether they like each other or not. Now, what's really interesting here, first of all, Mercury and Mars are not friends. Mercury quite likes Mars, so he actually does quite well in the signs of Aries and Scorpio, where he can really dig. But Mars doesn't like Mercury. Let me tell you this, when I, in all the charts that I've read, whenever I see Mars in the signs of Gemini or Virgo, as is the case here, there is always an issue with the brother, always. When it's up here in the air sign of communication, remember Mars is a hot, fiery planet in an air sign. It tends to combust and burn even more. There's always arguments with the brother or the siblings in some kind of way. Fierce arguments. They may love each other, but they really don't. They, re, you know, but they argue. They bicker. When Mars is in the sign of Virgo, what I found is there's either a major health issue with the brother or estrangement. I've seen it time. I'm, I'm taking. I'm saying literally hundreds of times. I've seen this, and when we also look here as well, we see Saturn is here strong in the sign of Virgo in William's tenth house. But Saturn and Mars are not friends. Saturn is what the planet of criticism, uh, duties, responsibilities of all kinds. But Saturn is also a planet of perfectionism. And separation, it deals with distances, large distances. So when we look here, we can see Saturn. They, look, William is distanced from Harry. They're estranged. 
Harry obviously wrote his all tell all book, you know, which was a slap in the face for everyone, wasn't it? But there it is. Now, what's interesting here is Saturn is technically strong in the sign of Virgo, but he's in a nakshatra called Hasta, which belongs to the moon, which is one of his enemies. So on paper, this Saturn is strong. So it shows that William has a lot of fortitude and discipline and stuff, particularly when it comes to his career, wanting to show up, stand up, be there. But it also shows there's a lot of frustration as well, because when um, Mars is considered the accelerator, Saturn is considered the brakes. And anyone who has a Saturn-Mars conjunction, they feel like at times that they're trying to drive their life with the handbrake on. So there's a lot of frustration as well within William in terms of his career, his public image, his name and fame, particularly as he feels defamed by Harry, his brother. But maybe Harry has feeling uh, not pleased because he may feel that maybe William is a bit too domineering, too perfectionist, too critical. And that's something Harry mentioned in his book, didn't he? Harry even said that William attacked him in the book. In the book, he said he attacked me and fell backwards and broke the dog bowl. Do you remember I was talking about how that intensity with K2, it, you know, when in a fire sign, it can deal with that. It can deal with things like violence. I'm not necessarily saying William is this violent guy going around beating people, but my God, he's probably got a temper on him. He really has, particularly with this moon in Ardra. Because the moon represents the mind. You know, I've got quite a fierce temper as well, but I've, I've learned to temper it with time. Temper it. Here, the moon gets very quick, very speedy. But here we can see there's this intensity here. I think William has intense emotions. And maybe, look, I'll tell you something. My late father, my late papa, not that he was a massive figure in my life, but, you know, I still I still love the guy. I didn't get to see him that much. But we, there were lots that we had in common. Anyway, my sister on my dad's side said to me, because uh, my dad, typical Jamaican, yeah, loved his, you know, yeah, his, his spliffs and stuff like that. And my sister told me something very poignant, very poignant. And what she said to me was, she said, dad smokes weed to stop the dreams. Think about that. To stop the dreams. My dad was very psychic, and I've got a lot of psychic stuff on my family line. Not This isn't obviously about my chart, but it's very obvious in my chart and stuff like that. Let me tell you something. Pe very often, people who suffer from addictions of any kinds, it's because they're too sensitive. It's not a critique. They just feel things immensely and they need to find a way to numb themselves. So imagine how much William is feeling with this Gandanta Neptune, which deals with drink and drugs and all of this kind of stuff. Escape, getting out of it, out of your body, which is why it can do with what? Getting drunk. Yeah, it's a form of liberation. You're numbed out. You're zoned out. I'm sure you guys would have seen some of the video videos by by Whimsy who's done a lot on this, you know, which, I mean, she's really gone to town on it. But I mean, but the but the point is, you know, yeah, you can see it here. So it's combined with that intense K2, which is a which is a vortex like a whirlpool anyway. Tremendous I I emotions going on within William. And maybe even psychic dreams and stuff like that, because his Venus is strong and Venus is the gift of prophecy. And K2 is very otherworldly and very psychic as well. So the sense I get is, is that if he has got this issue with alcohol or drugs or substances and stuff like that, it's to block things out. It's almost like he's too sensitive. I always say anyone who's got K2 in the first house, it's like when they're born, it's like they have got no skin. The, um, the Chinese sign of the dog is also very sensitive as well. K2 I call snip snip. What I found is K2 cuts a hole through the veil of forgetfulness that we pass through. So we never quite forget. We sometimes remember our past lives and all of this kind of stuff. So he's, he, let me tell you, William has probably got some extraordinary dreams where he's probably had visions of the future, this, that, and the other. Oh, God, it's just come to me. He may have even seen what was probably going to happen to his mother. My God, that's just come to me. Look, because they're opposite. 
And he's probably been what? Bottling all of that up. There's a lot here he doesn't feel he can share with people. So instead, he squashes it. Like a lot of people do, don't they? Those addictions and stuff like that, they squash it, they suppress it. But then things like that can, of course, um, you know, go the other way. I've just looked at the time. My goodness, I've gone over. Uh, yes. So there's that. Oh, and by the way, Venus can also represent sister-in-laws. Yeah. Because <laughs> Venus is, is women. So it's also daughters, sisters, wife, etc. significant women. A wound maybe from a sister-in-law interesting that isn't it or the wounding backwards and forwards this is so contentious isn't it i mean i hope that they can kind of sort it out and there's stuff here as well also as well in his 12th house which is also associated with blood pressures and stuff like that he's also very spiritual there is i think he's suppressing his spirituality but there's a quirkiness there as well in the bedroom department i'm just going to leave it there i don't want to throw any more than that but there's certain very interesting combinations so I, so I say that I can see in William's chart, but here you can see the estrangement here. Has the next chapter also deals with hands, magical hands. Uh, William may also have a gift for Reiki as well, believe it or not. I nicknamed this part of the um, Virgo Reiki's corner. I kid you not. So he's probably interested in alternative healings and stuff like that. And this is probably, again, something uh, he shares with his father, King Charles, who's been interested in all of that stuff for decades. So, you know, nobody's perfect. There is an issue there, I would say, with addiction, particularly uh, alcohol, but it is to suppress his volcanic emotions and this extraordinary hypersensitivity that he has uh, which can it's often express itself as anger as well as it often does uh, with men but he is also destined to become a monarch and a king because he was born on an eclipse and also rahu and ketu are the king makers also as well uh, by transit i can't remember yeah k2 here as you see where it says tr transits this is where the planets are right now k2 is right on his saturn look k is at 21 degrees 51 minutes his saturn is at 21 degrees 53 minutes absolutely slap bang and at the time of doing this video which the third of march 2024 the nodes of the moon are going to stand still for about three months this is going to be an incredibly intense time for William and with all kinds of duties, responsibilities and everything like that coming out of his ears. We've already seen that he had to pull out of his duties for the King of Greece's, uh, his godfather's memorial for personal reasons. Who knows what that's for? That's still question mark over that, isn't it? So there's a lot going on. And remember, look, this Pluto here is in sidereal Capricorn, which deals with what institutions of all kinds, business, governments, uh, pharmaceutical, like, like big businesses. It also deals with tradition and established institutions. So this, of course, as well, Capricorn will also represent the royal family. And here's Pluto doing its thing, dragging everything up from the underworld. And he's got K2 right on his Saturn for months. So there's a lot of transformation and change going on in William's life. Uh, a lot he's having to kind of deal with and it might be coming out sideways. So uh, I will leave it there. I hope you found that interesting. Let me just minimize that down. And uh, and of course, please don't forget to like, subscribe. I've gone a little bit over here, a bit longer than I planned. Uh, what I'll do is after this video, I will uh, link in uh, Kate's video if you've not seen that Catherine's video. And after this, I will do Diana. Yeah, I'll do Diana after this. So I will leave it there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. And please don't forget to like and subscribe and share if you found that interesting and you'd like to support my channel. All right. Big love. Bye-bye for now. Cheers.